greeting viewers. Thank you for joining us. Columbia Global Centers Nairobi warmly welcomes all the members of our audience to the continuation of the African Book Talk series. Columbia Global Centers Nairobi is part of nine regional hubs positioned around the world by Columbia University. The centers serve as platforms for dialogue and the exchange of knowledge in research, education, as well as public programming. Today, we are very privileged to host Dr. Kwan Liu, Kwan Q Lai, who is a true testament of what a caregiver is. Her selfless life brought her to Africa to treat people during the Ebola pandemic. Lest we forget, chronicles the hallowing and inspiring time she spent serving on the front lines of the, on, of the Ebola outbreak. The con complicated personal protective equipment, the chlorine scented air, the tropical heat, and the heartbreaking difficulties of treating patients she could not touch. Dr. Lai is a Harvard Medical Faculty physician specializing in, in infectious diseases. She is also a disaster relief medical volunteer who has volunteered her medical services worldwide. She treated Ebola patients in Liberia and Sierra Leone during the greatest Ebola outbreak in Africa and volunteered in Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, New York and on the US Virgin Island of St. Croix during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Lai has received numerous awards for her work, including being a three-time recipient of the President's Volunteer Service Award. Dr. Lai will be back on this platform on September 22nd to discuss her memoir. Please do not miss that episode. Our moderator, is Wendy Joroge, who is a bookish curator, entrepreneur, community builder, podcaster, and reading advocate. Her work is invested in making African literature discoverable to a wider audience. We will post this bias in a chat area. As we begin, kindly note, this program is being recorded and will be uploaded on, on our YouTube channel. As we proceed, please remember to post your questions under the Q&A area. For more informative programs, remember to follow us on our social media. My colleague will be posting our handles in the chat section. Wendy, you are most welcome to take it from here. Thank you so much, Pauline, um, for that introduction. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Lai, for making time to join. Um, this conversation, and most importantly, for all the work that you've done, and for this book that has memorialized um, some of the most, um, you know, important faces um, in modern history, and that's um, a global outbreak of, of disease. Um, then I would like to thank the audience for joining, for making time to join, and reiterate um, the uh, Pauline's instructions to please use the Q&A, but also feel free to post any, um, I mean, your minute by minute um, take on the chat, but if for questions specifically so that we're able to pick on the questions, uh, do use the Q&A. And without further ado, let us get into the book. Uh, the book is Lest We Forget, A Doctor's Experience with Life and Death During the Ebola Outbreak by Dr. Kwan Q. Lai. And we're joined by Dr. Lai today. Thank you so much, Dr. Lai. Maybe you can just uh, start us off with a little background. Um, I mean, you're, you're an award-winning doctor and now an author, but how did all this come together? What are some of the highlights that have led you to this day? Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank the Columbia Global Center of uh, Nairobi, Kenya uh, for hosting this uh, event. And I'd also like to thank Pauline for setting it up and, uh, and also Wendy for agreeing to moderate the session. Well, it, it is a fairly long story, but I will try to keep it short. 
I was uh, born in a very tiny island called Penang on the northwest coast of the Malay Peninsula. And uh, when I was growing up, we were quite poor and books were not accessible for me uh, for a long time until I was about 12 years of age when I was introduced to a free library uh, called the United States Information Service on my island. And because of that, my world was opened up for me. I was reading very, very avidly, and I learned about Dr. Tom Dooley and his human, humanitarian work in Laos and Vietnam. And I was very inspired by him. At the time in secondary school, I have a friend who had more accessibility to books, and she told me about Dr. Albert Schweitzer who went to Gabon in Africa to set up a hospital for the poor. These two men really inspired me and I thought that at some point in my life, I would like to do something on, along that line. Yeah. It was in the, yes, it was in the same library that in my later years in secondary school, I researched for admission to colleges in the United States and looking for a scholarship to attend college. And after several months of research, I applied to schools in the United States and I got accepted to Wellesley College that offered me a full scholarship to attend school. And because of that, I was able to uh, continue my education. My college motto is non ministrare sed ministrare, which means not to be ministered, but to minister. And that really is a motto that I follow pretty closely for most part of my life. And uh, I began my healthcare career in a very circuitous way. I went to Harvard Dental School. Uh, the first two years of my dental school, I spent um, two years in the Harvard Medical School studying basic sciences and also some clinical medicine. After that, after the two years, I was convinced that medicine is really for me, but I did finish dental school, after which I applied for medical school. And I eventually um, become a specialist in infectious diseases. So more than 17 years ago, when the tsunami hit Asia, uh, hitting Indonesia very badly, Thailand, India, and Sri Lanka, I decided that maybe it was time for me to try to, to uh, volunteer in a disaster response situation. It took me a while to find somebody to take me. I ended up in the um, southern part of India uh, doing um, medical relief. Initially, we were supposed to go to Indonesia, but the government decided to shut off uh, volunteers to their country. So we ended up being sidetracked to South India but that was a good experience. After that experience, I came back. I decided that I had to change my career and I left my position as a professor of medicine in the medical school and uh, tried to finagle my time so I could spend part of the time doing clinical medicine and part of the time volunteering uh, all over the world. Ever since then, I have volunteered my time in uh, many parts of the world in several continents, initially starting with HIV AIDS epidemic. And then I uh, branched out to natural disaster, such as after the earthquake in Haiti and Nepal, the typhoon that hit the Philippines in, in 2013, and uh, the drought in East Africa, the conflicts and wars in Libya and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and during, then during the outbreaks of uh, cholera in Haiti, and finally in the racist Ebola outbreak break in West Africa. I also spent quite a number of my months uh, in several refugee camps, and uh, I was on the mainland of uh, Greece, as well as in the island of Lesbos, taking care of uh, refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Iran, and also refugees from the Sub-Saharan uh, 
um, Africa, um, providing time to just take care of, of their healthcare needs. And uh, the, the experience that I had taking care of refugees in one of the biggest refugee camps in the world uh, were quite moving. And the biggest camp that I've spent time was in um, the Rohingya refugee camp in Cox's Baza in uh, Bangladesh. Now, if you may recall, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa started really at the end of 2013, and then it extended through 2016, so several years. Yeah. It remains one of the biggest uh, Ebola outbreak in the world. Yeah. In uh, 2014, sometime in the spring of 2014, WHO or World Health Organization finally acknowledged that there's the, the, the seriousness of the West Africa Ebola outbreak. And they started sounding the alarm that they, um, they needed more non-governmental organization to set up Ebola treatment units in Africa. Now, Medicine Sans Frontiers, which is Doctors Without Borders, was one of the first organization to be there in Guinea, in New Guinea to set up uh, Ebola treatment units. But they acknowledged that they could not be the only NGO in Africa to combat the outbreak. So in that year, 2014, several more NGOs started to make plans to build Ebola treatment units in uh, the other African countries where the um, Ebola had spread to uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia. Yeah. So I, after that, I spent about two, some, two months trying yeah. to find an organization to take me over there to help. Yeah, including indeed, right yeah. <laughs> I mean, indeed you speak about, I, I mean, um, as the book starts, you speak about the bureaucracy um, and how difficult it was for you to get uh, an organization to take you on. And I found that to be quite, uh, you know, sad uh, because here we have a huge outbreak, a serious need for qualified manpower, yet somebody who's very qualified and very willing, willing to risk um, their life literally um, is not, you know, it's, it's not so easy for you to get on. Uh, but now that we've had that, uh, epidemic behind us. And then, I mean, coming from uh, the most recent outbreak of COVID-19 COVID over the last say, three years, and perhaps you've probably seen some similarities. What are some of the ways that you think that, you know, uh, we, uh, what are some of the recommendations you'd have for people to be able to volunteer better? Or how can we get, you know, reduce the red tape and all the, uh, all the bureaucracy that makes it very hard for the health to get where it needs to go? I think that is a good question. It's a question that I can't answer because there are numerous uh, NGOs in this world and all of them have their own logistics of recruiting volunteers and they have mm -hmm. their rules. And I don't know all the rules they have and there is going to be a significant amount of red tape. Yeah. No matter how you go about it, how are you going to cut down the red tape? I have no idea how they do it. I, yeah. I know that some of them have a group of people that they already have as a frontline disaster response workers that they could send immediately. So those are the people who would be on the field pretty quickly. But those yeah. of us who are not on the roster, it will be a little bit more difficult for us to to be on the front line. And I, like you, was quite surprised and, uh, and baffled that, you know, for someone who was willing to help and who was willing to risk a life to, to go there, I did not receive a lot of responses or willingness to uh, take me on. But yeah. at some point when I got there, I think one of the reasons for the slowness in the Ebola uh, recruitment was because they were not ready. I found out that most of the NGOs have thought about it, 
but they have not started building Ebola treatment units. So they mm. were not ready to take on volunteers. So that was the main reason for the delay, although they would not come up uh, upfront to tell you yeah. about it. But yeah. I realized when I got there, yes, that was mm -hmm. one of the problems. Okay. The bonus yeah. is that the program. Okay, great. Now the book that um, you've written, uh, lest we forget, was it chronicles your journey because eventually you were able to volunteer and go to Sierra uh, to Sierra Leone uh, to Liberia and then Sierra Le Sierra Leone, um, mm -hmm. in two separate instances, uh, and it reads very very fresh. And I, re um, I realized reading that, you know, you kept a journal or rather you kept a blog as a way to update your family on what was going on. But I'm curious to know how you must have been writing this book, having to relieve, you know, especially the multiple uh, human uh, losses of human life and all the people that, you know, you were interacting with that were not able to make it through the, uh, uh the pandemic so uh are you how was that how was it relieving uh, through the writing process and indeed getting published and now that we have a book well as you said that i i kept a blog i at first when i started to volunteer in africa there was no such thing as internet it was very difficult to find internet so i actually kept a journal as you said to put down my experiences, my thoughts and reflections on, you know, once in a while and every few days. So I could go back and remember things that happened to my patients as well as the effects they have on my life. So when it came to Ebola, I had the fortune of good internet access because the U.S. Navy set up the lab and they needed uh, internet access. So they were the one who set it up for us. And I blocked almost every day uh, for when I was in the Ebola treatment unit. And I was glad that I did because it really made me, uh, give me a time to, for decompression after each day of about 10, 12 hours of working in the Ebola treatment unit. It was a good time for reflection for me to, it's a catharsis for me, uh, emotional catharsis. So I, I like that fact. And also I wrote down in detail my experiences with some of the patients because I don't want those memories to fade away. Memories of patients who are dying, patients who are brave to confront the disease, their families. And also want to preserve um, the effects they on on me. Uh, it, was, it was fresh at the day and I was able to record that. And I think it was good to do that um, in, at, the press, at the time when it happened rather than months, uh, years afterwards when your memories would be uh, fading. And so that, that was what I, the reason why I wanted to really honor the memory of the patients and their families and the healthcare workers who were so brave to go in there to help the patients. And so the book was like a dedication to them, a, uh, a tribute to all those uh, brave people. And I'm glad that I wrote it. And it was, it could be painful going over the scenarios again. And I, as preparing for the session, I reread my book and I brought back lots of memories of my time there and they were, pretty real and I, 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 I'm glad that I wrote the book that is out there for other people to share with other people. So it's not something that is that difficult. It was difficult to write, but it was worth um, the reason for writing the book. Yeah, indeed. Um, I find that when you're receiving news of such events, um, when it's statistics, you know, you hear several thousand died. Uh, at some point, the, there's a desensitization to what that could look like in actual real life. And so when you're dealing with like large numbers of people that are ill or dying, um, the statistics have a way of taking away that human face. 
So when you when a such a diary or such a book exists and you confront the names of Wata and and everybody else that you know either survived or did not survive, um, then it becomes you know it becomes a very real thing. How has the the reception of the book been? Uh, I I suppose you know other people in the healthcare sector or in infectious diseases have found this to be quite um, a resource. I don't really have. Um direct responses from people who read the book. Um, I have not really heard a lot from the infectious disease uh, circle, uh, whether people have read the book. The problem with uh, Lest We Forget was it took a while for the book to come out. And uh, I was, I had an agent just before I left for Sierra Leone for the my second book, which is Into Africa, Out of Academia, she was trying to find a publisher for that book. So when I had, was interviewed for my Ebola experience in Liberia, I realized that I have a lot of material for the book, for a book. And mm -hmm. Nuit Eisenman, the international correspondent for the National Public Radio of America, when she interviewed me, she hopped on the fact that I should write a book about my Ebola experiences. So she has also, she had also encouraged me to do that, but I have already had the idea that I showed. So I approached my agent about writing uh, an Ebola book, but she was not enthusiastic at the time. So, but I started writing it. Uh, and uh, after she had a hard time placing my book into Africa, she said that I sh we should really maybe work on the Ebola book. By then, it was, it took a year to find someone, and it will be another year and a half before it was published in 2018. By then, Ebola uh, was no longer in the picture, and uh, nobody was particularly interested in hearing Ebola. Uh, so I think the timing was not right, because if the timing was right, when you published the book uh, shortly after the outbreak or before the finish of the outbreak, it might be of interest to people. I really, from my personal point of view, I really have not heard very much responses from the Infectious Disease Society about the Ebola outbreak. So mm -hmm. I don't think the reception was... Uh, great in the sense of you know the book sales or anything like that so i think timing is pretty much everything yeah. but i despite that i'm glad that it's written and it's out there for someone interested in reading about the ebola outbreak yeah i mean i would say that we are discussing the book now so <laughs> you know uh, you never know when the when is the right time for and you know the beauty of uh, a record of a written record is that it's here for perpetuity and mm. you know it might not have uh, made the waves when it came out but in due time and it's there for the record and we are here talking about it so I think it's a really uh, good thing that you pushed forward to document that and and to push push through and have the book in print um, and as harrowing and as, you know, as hard it, as it was for me to read, I can only imagine how hard that was for you who was going through, who was living through it, but even more for the people that were suffering. And as we've seen uh, with the recent COVID-19 outbreak is that diseases, um, when a disease breaks out, you cannot keep it contained with a border, with walls, you know, uh, within national lines, and therefore all human suffering, I mean, any human suffering is all human suffering. So um, I just want to take this moment to reiterate the, uh, the, the earlier instructions for the audience. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A uh, um, function to leave in your questions. And I see we have one question, so, um, we can come back to that in a minute. But first, I just wanted to 
ask you, Dr. Lai, um, I'm sure being a doctor, you yes, you come across human suffering and sometimes death, uh, but this must have been on another scale, right? You know, losing patients on a daily basis <laughs> up to, I mean, I think the statistics were mortalities of 50% for Ebola. So being in the face of all that, what is the thing, what are some of the things that you've learned about human beings? Well, every day when I walked into the Ebola treatment unit, I was always amazed at the resilience of the patients and also the healthcare workers. And uh, our human spirit is amazing how we could overcome suffering and adversities and we could rise above all that to become better and kinder and compassionate human beings. So that was the first thing that struck me. Um, yeah. The other thing is I also marvel at humanity's ability and willingness to get up and help up with help other people in time of their trouble, even at the time when they are really risking their lives. Yeah. So that was the thing that really impressed me every day that I worked in the Ebola treatment unit. I mean, we yeah. worked, we felt like we were a big team, a, a team that was helping one another uh, to be safe. So yeah. that, that was the experiences that I felt. And it was really uplifting. Yeah able to uh, to be in a team like that. Wow, and, and thank you for doing that work. Um, as you detail in the book, and I would encourage everyone in the audience, if you haven't had a chance to get the book, um, you can get the book after this session. I think copies are available via Amazon. And as you detail in the book, how physically harrowing it was to work in the PPEs, at some point, um, you know, uh, it, you couldn't be in the PPE for more than an hour because of the discomfort of, you know, of being in such a space suit. And um, again, just an, as an encouragement to everyone in the audience to read the book so that you can get all the details. And at this point, I would like to direct your attention to a question that we've had. We had in the question bin, uh, and this is from Dr. Ba who asks, who says, are very well done for your determination and hard work. You're such a great example to follow. And her question is, through your journey as a professor and a volunteer, what's worked well for you and what hasn't gone very well? And what would you do differently going forward? Would you like to, well, to address that? <laughs> I, I actually don't, uh, fully understand the question, but mm. I will try to okay. say that as a professor, when you try to go out to volunteer, it was in America, it was quite difficult. You have no um, leeway to leave your place of work at a moment's notice. Uh, disaster response is when you are supposed to be able to leave in three to five days, sometimes in two days or one day to go to a place where the disaster uh, happened. But as a, uh, a professor, because you have a lot of duties and you have patients to care for, you cannot just pick, drop everything and leave. So yeah. that was one of the reasons why I had to uh, leave and to find something that was more flexible for me. So that was one of the hindrances of being able to be flexible enough to, to leave for things that you really want to do. Um, mm. And as a professor on the field, I really didn't find that difficult. In HIV AIDS, I spent time being an educator. And uh, so that was my role as an educator, as a professor. I was able to devise ways to teach uh, and share my knowledge to the Af my African colleagues on how to best take, in, take care of the patients. The thing that was really hard was the lack of resources 
in many of the African countries I went to. So we, as a professor in the first world, you felt like you had a lot of things that you can use and yeah. you can do a lot of tests. But when you put yourself in a nation that had lack resources, you have to improvise. Yeah. So that is the hurdle that you have to jump through to, uh, to work in a nation that has fewer resources than what you're used to. Okay, um, that's, a, that's a good can-do approach to life, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I've been very, very impressed by many African healthcare workers who yeah. are experts enough to do lots of things that we in America cannot do. Yeah. Like I can't disagree, <laughs> but there are healthcare workers who never went through medical school. They are able to deliver babies and even in difficult circumstances. I'm amazed at that. Okay, great. Um, and since we are speaking about your experience um, in West Africa, uh, Jennifer is asking uh, you to speak a little bit more on how you were able to navigate different cultures um, that especially have a different belief and approach to how they treat death and care for, um, you know, maybe the dying or the, <laughs> treat the body and which again in this case is a you know is a direct source of transmission for ebola so that's jennifer if you'd like to take that question well that was uh something a ritual that uh, people followed in west africa when somebody dies uh, that body is lovingly washed and clean before burial and before then there will be a funeral service where relatives and friends will come and pay the respect. And there will also be a lot of uh, contact, body contact with the deceased. And yeah. so that is the tradition uh, in West Africa. And I think even before I came to the scene, I think people had learned that that is a source of uh, transmission of Ebola. That's why yeah. the transmission was so great at the beginning. And to then to tell the people that they can no longer follow the tradition. They have yeah. to take care of themselves, they have to protect themselves from getting Ebola. It is really a very hard thing to do. And uh, I, I was in, not in that position to tell them. And, uh, but then by the time I, I got there, I think people were aware of the contagion of Ebola and people were very careful about touching bodies. So I think we have to respect the tradition at the same time, we have to be realistic that if that's the source and the way you get Ebola, then we need to protect the people in a respectful way, telling them that this might not be something that you have to do, you could do anymore from yeah. you know, to onwards when the Ebola outbreak uh, is raging. Yeah. Um, th yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And please keep them coming. And I, that particular question just brings me to a, a factor that you are reflecting on um, in the book where you are talking about how do you care for patients that you cannot touch? And it made me think of, you know, the, how important, you know, that human to human touch is in healthcare and in, in, you know, in communicating empathy and in giving um, hope to the ailing. Uh, but some of the, what are some of the ways that you navigated, you know, that uh, barrier, which, you know, because of the nature of Ebola and the PPEs that yeah, you were required to wear, uh, it was virtually impossible, you know, to, you know, to have a human to human contact with patients. Yeah. You could not have skin-to-skin -skin contact, but despite the fact that we had PPE, we could still uh, touch the patient through our PPE, even though we didn't have skin-to-skin -skin contact. And then mm -hmm. there, are, there were ways in which we could put our arm around the patient and holding the patient's hand tightly and conveying the message that we, we are there, or we care mm -hmm. for them. And, uh, there were nurses who would hold 
babies or young patients and uh, sing lullaby to the uh, the patients. So that the ways that we can do it. I mean, the ways that other ways we could do it is to offer uh, oral rehydration solution by you know picking up a cup or a mug to the patient's mouth, and that's a way of caring for the patient. Um, yeah. Despite the fact that we couldn't really touch the patient, but we can certainly say kind words, and people say you know say prayers for the patients. Uh, those are the ones, those are the things of comfort that could be done despite the fact that we couldn't really have close skin contact. Mm. Okay, and um, I think we have another question, but before we get into, into that, I'm just curious because um, right when we, uh, as we started, uh, you detailed your volunteering experience in various places and you've been to different continents and different countries for various uh, relief um, efforts. But I'm curious to know how you adjust to in different cultures, in different situations. I know the humidity was really a challenge, but there's always the food and how people relate to each other. Um, yeah, what are some of the ways that you have, <laughs> you know, you found your, the tips that work for you when you adjust, when you have to work in a different culture and environment? Well, um, the, the language is one thing. Um, in, in Africa, there, there's so many tribal languages. So in Liberia, I was very lucky because most people speak English. So yeah. even though they have a very strong Liberian accent, sometimes you have trouble understanding the English. But that was a, a way of communication with me. A lot of the villages, though, still speak a tribal language, and we still need interpreters to help us understand uh, the patient's needs. So that's one thing. Uh, culture of uh, food in the in the camp in the, where we were living. Um, because most of them were expats, they try to you know, find food that are palatable to us. To me, though, I, I'm pretty um, able to uh, get used to the, to the local food. So I have no trouble doing that. The only thing now that I have trouble is that I am a vegetarian, so it's harder for me to avoid goat meat or whatever <laughs> in, in different areas so I try to say send me some beans and rice and I'll be, I'll be happy with that. So you, you can go around uh, getting used to uh, different things and culturally is, is you have to be sensitive to people's culture you know when you are in a country where um, Islam is the main religion we have to be respectful of how we dress and uh, we certainly need to us, I usually would ask the coordinators or the people who live there, what can be done um, in the eye of the people uh, living there, whether something that I do um, yeah. offend them. So they will tell me, you know, there are things yeah. that you could do, there are things that you should not do. Yeah. So those are the things that I go around uh, trying to educate myself. Okay. And that's great advice. And I see we have a few more questions. Um, there's Scott who's asking how, I suppose as a professor in your capacity as a professor, uh, you think the medical schools can better prepare students to engage in relief work. And then Elena um, as well, I'd like to combine the two questions or rather read them both and you can take them in whichever order you feel comfortable. Elena asks, uh, says, thank you very much for sharing your personal and professional journey. And her question is, considering the tremendous stress that you're under during the Ebola outbreak, how do you maintain your psychological and spiritual well-being? And what personal practices, if any, helps you endure? Yeah, so those are the two questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's actually a days and the Ebola unit was so long that by the time I came home, I uh, would eat my dinner and then I would uh, sit down in front of my laptop to 
put down my thoughts for the day. So that really helped me a lot. I had eventually in the third week that I had a roommate from Kenya and she and I will share experiences. So we commiserated with each other and that really helped. And uh, I actually also requested a day off now and then so yeah. I could at least go to church, yeah, even though it's social distancing at church, no touching, but it was something that you have a way to get to know the community. And uh, so that, that's how I try to, uh, to get myself calmed down. And the other thing is I, I'm a runner. So I go running around the university campus just to decompress, to uh, de reduce the stresses that I have in yeah. working in the Ebola unit. Yeah. And I also found that in communication with the people who live there, uh, you, you really get a sense of how they felt about the, the outbreak. Um, because I try to reach out to the community and talk to them, I, I found that to be very helpful because they have a different perspective on yeah. the Ebola outbreak. While we were so concentrated in the unit, uh, we forgot that there is in the larger world there were people still living their life in the midst of the outbreak. So that really helped. Yeah. And I, I would say the blog, <laughs> you know, uh, which again became the foundation of this book, um, you would write uh, your experiences, you would compress uh, your experiences on the blog. So I think I would just mention that also that was a way to center mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Yeah. I consider myself very lucky to be able to be given the opportunity to go to the Ebola unit to yeah. take care of patients. Because I had many, many reporters, uh, reporters from New York Times, who wanted very much to get the experience of personally to be in a unit so they can witness what, how the patient, what the patient felt. But they were not allowed to because it was too dangerous for them to be in there. Yeah. Yeah. So that we, we were the privileged one in the sense that we were able to have to be witnesses to the patient's struggles and uh, triumph as well at times yeah. when a lot of the patients survived. Yeah. Um, yes, um, so this Scott who was, uh, is curious to know what are your, some of the ways that you think that medical schools can better prepare students to engage in relief work? Any oh, that is, a, that is a good question because in my time, unfortunately, there was not much of a uh, push to uh, do relief work or to have a program of global health. There was no such thing. And I, when I was a professor, I tried to push for that. So people, the people in the fellowship, the infectious disease fellowship would have an avenue to go to the developing world to experience what it was like to do healthcare in a resource um, limited area. Yeah. Um, that was just like in the beginning stages of it. But now I think most medical schools have a global health uh, um, department. So I think medical schools now have some avenues, the students have some avenues to be able to branch out uh, to developing world to learn about healthcare. And I think that is a very good thing uh, for you know, medical students as well as uh, infectious disease fellows to be able to, to have that experience because then you know whether this is what you want to do. And yeah. uh, you have some experience in it and you can tell yourself whether this is the way that you want to go. To volunteer while you are a student, maybe possible while you are a permanent healthcare worker in the hospital or a, in academia will be quite difficult unless you are a you know, program director of a global health uh, department that you can spend a chunk of your time in the developing world, developing a program or running a program, it would be hard to uh, take time off. Yeah. Okay. That's some good thought um, on that. And another, I think I see we have another question. <laughs> um, and Maya uh, wants to 
um, appreciates you greatly. So she says, with great appreciation, Dr. Lai, uh, was very nice to volunteer with you in New Mexico during the COVID pandemic. Hello, <laughs> Thank Maya. <you. laughs> Thank you, Columbia University. Uh, this is a great session, very valuable. So there is one of your colleagues. <laughs> so that's, that's good to know that you've been able to create community uh, wherever you have landed. That was a um, great uh, uh, experience that we had in the Navajo Nation. Uh, we we uh, took care of uh, COVID-19 patients in a very, very remote area in the Navajo Nation. Great. And you mentioned earlier that, you know, there's another book, that you have another book. Do you want to speak uh, briefly about you know your other um, your other published works or what is coming up um, because I, I see that we are almost at you know at the top of our time so I'd like to give you this opportunity to um, to, to you know to talk a bit about um, your other published works as we also give a chance to everyone in the audience to, you know to grab a copy of lest we forget so that they can read for themselves the entirety of the book. Well, in, uh, in September, as Pauline pointed out, that I'll be discussing my, uh, my other book, Into Africa, Out of Academia, The Doctor's Memoir. So yeah. that will be discussed, and that's already out in the world for a, a few years now. And this yeah. October, this, my third book will be out, called The Girl Who Taught Herself to Fly. It is... Uh, a memoir and it was about my growing up in Malaysia and yeah. how I struggled to get an education and then my life changed when I got a full scholarship from Wellesley College. So it'll be out in October. It can be pre-ordered in any of the book sites that you go to and, uh, and uh, have fun reading it. <laughs> Great. Um, I mean, thank you very much for, you know, for the generosity with which you've shared um how else can people stay in touch with you are you on social media do you have a website where people can follow what you're doing even beyond you know the two books that are coming out yeah i have a website uh which is my full name kwanqlai.com and where i list list the, the things that i have been doing and also my books so yeah. and that you can subscribe to that website and get to know what i'm doing Oh, great. Um, I think I would, would like to close it there um, because, unless there's somebody who has a really pressing question that they can, you know, um, send in the next half a minute. <laughs> but I'd like to say thank you so much for, you know, for, for doing this, for putting um, this work out uh, because as we've learned that it's very important for us to take the lessons. I mean, even after the disaster is over, it's very important for us to take the lesson, the lessons forward. Um, and so that we can prevent or, or even deal better with the next uh, global um, disaster that's, you know, that's likely to come. And I see Pauline has put in um, the link to the website. So people can, you know, click on that link. Uh, that's www.quanculai.com and I see no other questions and so I'd like to uh, patch this back to Columbia Global Center. I think Sandra, the floor is yours. And thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Dr. Lai. Thank you, Wendy, for gracing our, our virtual uh, book talk today. Um, I was very excited to just meet you, Dr. Lai. I'm very impressed uh, by all the good things, the, the list of just accolades and the volunteer experience that you have is very admirable. And most of all, I was really touched by the fact that you always choose to come and volunteer here at home in Africa. And we really thank you just for the service that you continuously just hand over to us. And we hope to one day meet you in person because you're just truly inspiring. 
Um, I hope to just have another great talk with you on 20, 22nd, 28th um, September um, in and out, in, out of academia and into Africa. I bet it will also be another interesting session and we cannot wait. And we will ask our audience to look out to our social media channels to, for the follow-up of where you can sign up and how, um, and just the updates of what the book could be about. So thank you so much. May you all enjoy your evening. May you all enjoy your days, if you're beginning your day, and we hope to reconvene again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.